Well, thank you very much indeed for your warm welcome. That's really appreciated. And let me say what a privilege it is to be here uh, at Gordon College over these few, d few days. I'm really enjoying it, having some great discussions, and hoping to have plenty more today. I find it actually, uh, it's quite remarkable that here we are in the year 2014, and we're discussing Adam and Eve. I just found that in itself, actually, as an evolutionary biologist, really interesting. Actually, if I mention the topic Adam and Eve to my secular biology colleagues, um, generally speaking, what I get is a kind of withering glance, as if one shouldn't kind of mention that topic in polite company. If I, on the other hand, mention the topic in certain Christian circles, which I'm sure are not like the ones here this morning, I can be looked upon as maybe some kind of heretic, especially if I'm speaking to the topic also at the same time as speaking about evolution. Maybe I'm not even a Christian. On the other hand, some secular audiences I find are quite fascinated by the topic, especially when they find out that what they had in mind is not at all what many Christians have in mind when they talk about Adam and Eve. And of course, for your average Christians, well, I think the topic is one which pops up now and again, and you kind of wonder, well, how does that theological account in the early chapters of Genesis relate to modern science and biology? And that's our topic for this morning. Just last Wednesday, um, I was having lunch in Cambridge. That's, by the way, our Cambridge over in England, where I live. Uh, and I was having lunch with an agnostic friend. He's a lapsed Catholic. Uh, he, was, he has a pretty typical kind of story. He was brought up as a Catholic. He went to university. Um, he gave up his faith. Uh, he became a very uh, successful financial investor. And now in later life, he's gone back and he's reconsidering his faith once again. He's on some kind of journey. In fact, he's even enrolled in a course in philosophy to, as part of his spiritual journey. But what I found quite surprising during our conversation was when this very committed agnostic came out with this question. And I quote, how could it be that Christ came to die for the sin of Adam when we know, he said, that the Adam and Eve story is just a myth? Well, I hope that my talk today will at least begin to help explain the kind of response that I gave to my friend at lunchtime just last week. And since our time is short this morning, I'm going to start by telling you where I come from, from the point of view of hermeneutics, because uh, that's going to save some guessing games as we go along this morning. So here's my starting assumptions. First of all, one, I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God from cover to cover. I've always done so, as long as I can remember. Secondly, I believe that the Bible contains reliable scientia, scientia, the Latin word for science, as used in the Middle Ages. Of course, it doesn't mean what we mean by science now um, with modern empirical science today, but it rather means any, at that time, any body of constructed academic kind of knowledge. In actual fact, the Bible, of course, doesn't really contain science in that modern sense because um, the whole scientific literature didn't really start coming to being until the middle part of the 17th century and onwards, but the Bible certainly contains scientia. Thirdly, I don't believe in concordism. That's the attempt to impose a scientific understanding onto biblical texts in order to make them concord with modern science. Instead, I believe we should treat biblical texts with their own integrity and with their own context, and exactly the same with scientific knowledge as well. We should respect the integrity of each discipline in its study. And only when we've done that task of studying the science or studying the theology then we should bring them in conversation with each other. Fourthly, I take the early chapters of Genesis as a series of profound theological essays which reveal inspired truths which form the bedrock basis of the Christian gospel, the story of creation, fall, and redemption. Fifthly, as a biologist, I simply accept evolution as the paradigm within which all biological research is carried out not as some kind of static, fixed theory, but as a reliable theory, which explains very well the origins of biological diversity on this planet, including, of course, us. Let's just think a little bit about the biblical material. Of course, with this audience, I'm sure we hardly need to spend much time on this and thinking about what the biblical texts actually tell us about Adam and Eve. But let's just remind ourselves that there are three rather different ways in which the Genesis text uses the language of Adam. The very first mention of Adam in the Bible comes in Genesis 1, of course, where it means humankind. 
And then these verses are repeated again in Genesis chapter 5. That God created Adam. He made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them Adam. So clearly, Adam can refer to humankind, and it's only humankind that are made in the image of God. Well, as you probably know, Genesis is structured according to families. It's got this 11-fold toledoth repeat, which can be translated, this is the family history of. And the very first toledoth we come across is in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, and it introduces us to God's very first family. And there we have the entrance of a king, God's ambassador on earth in Genesis chapter 2. And I say a king because the language of the image of God in its context is kingly and priestly language. Indeed, in early Christian interpretation, the church father Origen, for example, portrays Adam as high priest. But we go on to read, this is a dusty king. The Lord God formed Yatsar Adam from the Adama, from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the Adam became a living being. The Adam became a nefesh, a breath or a soul. And this very material nature of the creation, including the man, is underlined by verse 9. We read that after placing the man in the garden in the east, in Eden, God then made all kinds of trees grow out of the Adama, out of the ground, the dust. Now, there are many important points packed into these verses. First of all, there's a very good Hebrew word for man in Hebrew, the word ish. It's used for the whole rest of the Old Testament, actually, to refer to man. In fact, my computer tells me uh, 1,671 times. And so the choice of Adam here to refer to man seems to be a very deliberate teaching tool to explain to the reader that Adam not only comes from the Adama, from the dust, but is also given the important task by God of caring for the Adama. Earthy Adam is to be God's earth keeper. And second, we note the use of the definite article in front of Adam in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, the man. And that definite article remains in place all the way through to Genesis chapter 4 when Adam without a definite article appears and lay with his wife again. So, I don't know if you know, but personal names in Hebrew do not carry the definite article. So perhaps there's a particular theological point being made here. Here is the man, a very particular man, the archetypal man perhaps, the representative man perhaps of all other men. But however we're to understand the use of the definite article, there's no doubt this is a very deliberate strategy in this tightly woven text with no less than 20 mentions of the man in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. So, the early chapters of Genesis then present Adam with three rather distinctive meanings. First, as humankind. Second, the man, perhaps referring to Adam, as I say, as the archetypal man, a representative for humankind. And then third, as Adam, the individual, who marries Eve, has a big family, and dies at a ripe old age. And it's also worth pointing out that Adam and Eve could not have been the Hebrew names they called each other because Hebrew did not appear until somewhere in the middle of the second millennium BC. This means they must be assigned names intended by speakers of Hebrew to convey a particular meaning, a particular theolo theological meaning. As Wheaton professor John Walton comments, in English if we read that someone's name is human and his partner's name is life, we quickly develop an impression of what is being communicated. As, for example, in Pilgrim's Progress, where characters are named Christian, Faithful, and Hopeful. These characters, by virtue of their assigned names, are larger than the historical characters to whom they refer. They re represent something beyond themselves. Now, after Genesis chapter 5, there's actually only one more clear mention of Adam in the whole of the Old Testament, and then just nine mentions in the New Testament. And it does seem, for these citations, that they view Adam as likewise, they view Eve as referring to real historical individuals. And two observations in particular point in that direction. First of all, Adam is included in the, gene in, in the genealogies found in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, and then in Luke chapter 3. 
And then secondly, in 1 Corinthians 15, a direct comparison is made between the first Adam and the last Adam, Christ. It does seem, to me anyway, the most natural reading of that passage is that just as the last Adam was a real historical figure, so was the first Adam. Now, on this biblical material, I want to give a little plug here for a book that hasn't come out yet, um, but it's again a book written by John Walton from Wheaton entitled The Lost World of Adam and Eve. It won't be out until next March for some reason. It's uh, in press, but I do recommend that book, which I have read in manuscript form, as a wonderful contribution to this literature. Okay, that was a little bit of the biblical introduction, and now for a bit of science. Clearly, we don't have enough time today to do justice to the enormous literature that concerns human evolution. And I realize there's going to be some here this morning who maybe don't believe in our common descent with the apes. There will be others here who have no problem with that. My purpose here this morning is not to try and persuade you one way or the other on that particular point. But I do think that Christians of all people do need to have a clear and accurate idea in this area of what's going on in the scientific literature. So, if you're one of those who just don't believe in common descent, then at least I think it's important to have clarity about what you don't believe in. And as I'm sure everyone here is aware, human evolution entails not that we descended from the apes, but rather that we share common ancestors with the other apes. The most recent common ancestor we have with our closest uh, first cousin, the chimpanzees, lived around five to six million years ago. There were certainly no chimps around five million years ago. We certainly weren't around, and since that time, we have been evolving down this rather complex lineage of intermediates until the chimps emerged in, in their lineage by around 600,000 years ago, and we likewise have been evolving through many different species of hominin until finally anatomically modern humans began to emerge in Africa about 200,000 years ago. So the term hominin refers to all those intermediate species that lie between us and our last common ancestor with the chimps. And the founding population of anatomically modern humans in Africa has been estimated using genetic data to number around 9,000 to 12,000 individuals. There is no genetic evidence for a single couple being the genetic progenitors of the whole human race. And it's worth remembering that speciation takes place over a lengthy period of time, tens of thousands of years or more, within a reproductively isolated population. Now, the idea of a last common ancestor, I think, is familiar also to those who are studying languages. The tree of biological life is like the tree of languages. Each one has a last common ancestor. So, for example, if you want to locate the last common ancestor between Dutch and English, then you can track it back and find its old Saxon and so forth, a rather similar kind of tree. And it was Darwin's brilliance to bring history into biology, envisaging the whole evolutionary process as one giant tree with many branches and many twigs on the branches. So likewise, we can envisage human evolution as a branch of that tree with many twigs, and we are located on one of those twigs an insight that at least should help to keep us humble. Now, what kind of data might we want to put forward to, share, to show that we actually share a last common ancestor with the chimps about five million years ago? I just want to give you a couple of examples here. Our genomes contain thousands of genetic fossils coming from our evolutionary past. In fact, we're all of us here this morning like walking genetic fossil museums. And a genetic fossil simply means a stretch of DNA, which can be hundreds or even thousands of genetic letters long, that is presently non-functional and which we can use to track our evolutionary history. And as the genetic fossil comes into our evolutionary, evolutionary past, like a visiting card, so the presence or absence of the visiting card can be used to track our ancestry. Consider this diagram here on the screen which illustrates our recent history with the apes. So the last common ancestors are labeled A, B, and C. The yellow heart there on the screen with an X in it is a genetic fossil. It's found in the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and in us, but not in the orangutan, with which we had a last common ancestor about 15 million years ago. 
And so that means that it must have come into our lineage sometime after C, our last common ancestor with the orangutan. That's the way this sleuthing is done using genetic fossils. Multiply that by hundreds of examples and you get some idea of the very powerful evidence that we have. Let's just take one example to illustrate this point. Here's a pseudogene example. Pseudogenes are those genes that were functional in our distant ancestors and that retain their function in living representatives of those lineages, but which have been switched off in our own genomes by mutations. And they're lying there like derelict machinery as a vivid memory of our evolutionary past. For our pseudogene example, let's think why sailors in previous centuries used to suffer from the disease scurvy on long voyages. And of course, the reason, as you probably know, is their stocks of fruit ran out after a few weeks at sea. In the late 1700s, the British Navy started supplying its ships with millions of gallons of lemon juice, eradicating scurvy. But it wasn't until 1928 that a Hungarian biochemist discovered the ingredient that cured scurvy. We now know it as vitamin C. So why can't we make vitamin C ourselves, given that most other mammals, like rats and so on, can make their own vitamin C? Well, it turns out that mammals such as rats and mice have a gene called GULO, which encodes an enzyme called GLOW. I'll just give you the acronym. And that's needed to synthesize vitamin C. But a mutation entered into the primate lineage more than 35 million years ago, so we all have now in our genomes only the non-functional pseudogene version of GULO, and we have to keep eating all those oranges in order to stay healthy. And the reason that the mutation didn't really matter at the beginning is that the primates in which it first occurred had plenty of fresh fruit to eat. But as soon as human sailors started going on these long voyages, that's when the need for a functional GULO gene really became apparent. And so this slide then shows you the nucleotide sequence, the sequence of genetic letters in the DNA, which is part of the gene that's been mutated, and it compares the sequence with that found in other apes, in the macaque, which is an old world monkey, and in humans. And as you can see, the ape, the macaque, and human gene sequences are nearly identical to the rats, but they lack this single letter A at nucleotide position 97. It's been knocked out by the mutation. And it's that same mutant gene which has been reproduced down the primate generations at least since before the last common ancestor of apes and old world monkeys around 35 million years ago, which is a very remarkable observation, actually. And so what happens when you get this so-called point mutation is that the genetic code becomes gibberish. And so the gene can no longer be used to make the protein GULO or GLOW. And that this random, highly unlikely mutation is present in all the primate species examined indicates that it occurred only once in an ancestor of the great apes and the macaques. The chances of the same mutation happening more than once in exactly the same genetic letter in a gene thousands of letters long is vanishingly small. And so common descent provides the best explanation for this observation. And you can multiply, as I say, these kind of examples hundreds and hundreds of times. Now, I just want to make a couple more points about the science before we dive into uh, the relationship between the science and theology. First of all, anatomically modern humans, as I say, didn't start appearing in Africa until around 200,000 years ago. And then they spread around the world from about 60,000 years ago. First, they went east, arriving in Australia by around 50,000 years ago. Then when the weather in Europe got a little bit better, it's not so great these days either, but it got a bit better, they started populating Europe from around 43,000 43, years ago. And by 18,000 years ago, they were wading across the Bering Strait, which was pretty shallow at that time, and then populating the Americas with astonishing speed. Life here was clearly good. Of course, it still is. Second point, until 2010, a fairly straightforward replacement model held sway. This is the idea that that emigrant population out of Africa populated the world by replacing the more ancient hominin populations that were already in existence in various places without much interbreeding. That's what we thought before the year 2010. But since that year, the picture has been changing. 
And it's now become apparent through genomics, through DNA sequencing, that there was, in fact, some limited interbreeding or introgression, as it's called. And so today, all non-Africans contain somewhere between 1.5 and 2.1% of Neanderthal DNA in our genomes. There's also a first cousin of the Neanderthals called the Denisovans, and something between 1 and 6% of Denisovan DNA is today found in Melanesians, Aboriginal Australians, Polynesi Polynesians, and some other related groups in the Western Pacific, but not in Africans or Eurasians. So it's amazing the sleuthing that we can do now with contemporary genomics. So the point here is that a kind of picture is emerging that there may have been a whole range of hominin species living at the same time as anatomically modern humans as recently as 30 to 80,000 years ago. And some of them, in fact, interbred with modern humans, not a lot, but sufficient to leave behind their genetic visiting cards in individual samples of the present human genome. So if we keep to a very strict definition of a biological species, a population that is reproductively separated from other populations, modern humans have only been a complete separate species for around the past 30,000 years. So that's a bit on the science. Now, how can we build bridges between anthropology and theology on the subject of Adam and Eve? I want to introduce this morning a few possible models which have the aim of at least being consistent with both scientific and biblical data. Models, of course, in science seek to weave together different types of data to generate a coherent story. But the models being suggested here are not scientific models as such, but they rather aim to do an analogous kind of job in relating the theological and anthropological narratives. And if you'd like to uh, call them speculations or thought experiments, um, that's absolutely fine because, in fact, they are indeed just that. They go, in fact, way beyond the data that we have available. I'm not suggesting these models are found within Scripture, nor indeed within science. That's just the point. But they do aim to be consistent with both types of narrative. So, what are some of the options on the table? I'm going to speed through a few examples. Model A is an ahistorical view that suggests that there is no connection at all between the theological and biological narratives. In fact, maybe it's not correct to really call it a model at all for that reason, although I label it here in this way just to make it easier to discuss. In Model A, the purpose of the early chapters of Genesis is to provide a theological account of the role and importance of humankind in God's purposes cast in the mold of a narrative in Adam and Eve, which is a myth in the technical sense of being a story or parable, having the main purpose of teaching eternal truths without the constraints of historical particularity. So as far as the fall is concerned, within this idea, the Genesis 3 narrative of man's disobedience is the story of every man. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Genesis text presents this truth in a vivid narrative style that is about theology rather than history, a theological essay which is true for all time. This is highlighted in Romans 5.14 where Adam is called the typos of Christ, the archetype of Christ. Now, certainly I think there are great theological truths in Model A, and indeed the other models in the, indeed encompass such truths. But I suspect that this model alone isn't quite bold enough in tackling <coughs> the difficult questions, questions that won't go away. For example, there is no evidence that beings prior to Homo sapiens were spiritually alive in the sense of having a saving personal knowledge of God. <coughs> so at some point in our history, it must be the case that humans began to experience such knowledge of God that they had not had before. Therefore, we cannot escape the historical question as to when that might have happened. I mean, at what point did people become responsible to God for their actions in such a way that they could be judged by God? At what point did a community of faith become established in which people worshipped the one true God? Now, of course, these are typically modern questions which the Bible really has no interest in answering for us, and we don't really know the answers to any of them, but the models that follow at least start speculating about such things. 
So let's move on. And you can tell I'm a scientist because all my models are well labeled. Model B1 is a gradualist proto-historical view, meaning that it is not historical in the usual sense of that word, but it does refer to events that took place in particular times and locations. So the model suggests that as anatomically modern humans evolved in Africa from 200,000 years ago, or during some period of linguistic and cultural development since that time, there was a gradual growing awareness of God's presence and calling upon their lives to which they responded in obedience and in worship. The earliest spiritual stirrings of the human spirit were in the context of monotheism, and it was natural for humans at the beginning to turn to their creator in the same way that children today naturally seem to believe in God almost as soon as they can speak. And so in this model, the early chapters of Genesis are a theological representation, if you like, of this early gradual spiritual development in a form that could be understood within the Near Eastern culture of that time. And Model B1 therefore presents the Genesis account of Adam and Eve as a myth in the technical sense of the word again, a story or parable having the main purpose of teaching eternal truths, albeit one that refers to real putative events that took place over a prolonged period of time during those early years in Africa. And within, this small, within this model, the fall is interpreted as the conscious rejection by humankind of the awareness of God's presence and calling upon their lives in favor of choosing their own way rather than choosing God's way. And so the fall in this model becomes a long historical process, a process of alienation from God, if you like, going over many, many generations. A variant of B1 is model B2. It's still in Africa here. But this model B, B2 wishes to preserve the idea of an original couple who are in some sense the ancestors of the whole human race but it places them within that early small community of around 10,000 anatomically modern humans that are presumed to have been living somewhere in Africa around 200,000 years ago. Now, counting against both versions of Model B is the way in which they evacuate, as you can see, they evacuate their accounts of any kind of Near Eastern context. And so they detach them from their Jewish roots. If the early chapters of Genesis are about God's dealings with the very early people of God who much later came to be called the Jews, then clearly Africa is not the direction in which we should be looking. And then as far as B1 is concerned, many Christians, though certainly not all, would see the New Testament's interpretation of Adam and Eve as focusing more on real historical individuals. Model B2 wishes to preserve the idea that the Adam and Eve of the Genesis account are in some sense at the root of the whole human race, not only spiritually, but also physically. From a scientific perspective, however, this doesn't really work. The community of roughly 10,000 reproductively active individuals to whom we all go back in Africa is a dynamic, not a static population. It's a genetic bottleneck, if you like. It is populations that speciate not individuals, and that's a process that takes tens of thousands of years. Furthermore, and here it gets perhaps a little bit technical, but there are multiple recombination events in the roughly 8,000 generations that have occurred since the existence of this putative couple according to Model B2 that would entail that individuals alive today would contain few, if any, of the copies of that particular couple's genes. Genetically, they could not have been the physical ancestors of the whole of humanity. So the idea of a single couple who somehow transmitted their sin by physical inheritance to the whole of humanity cannot be sustained by such a scenario. True, their genes would have contributed something to the succeeding populations, but so were the genes of all the others in their community. And so the next model that I want to mention to you seeks to address some of these concerns, and this is Model C. So Model C takes us right away from any questions about genetics or evolution, and it focuses on the beginning of God's spiritual family here on Earth. And according to Model C, God chose a community or even a couple of Neolithic farmers in the Near East, maybe around 8,000 years ago, to whom he chose to reveal himself in a special way, calling them into fellowship with himself so that they might know him as the one true personal God. From now on, there will be a family, a community, 
who would know that they were called to a holy enterprise, called to be carers of God's creation, called to know God personally. Being an anatomically modern human was necessary but not sufficient for being spiritually alive, as remains, of course, the case today. Just as I can go out on the streets of Boston and I wouldn't know which people are spiritually alive to God and which people are spiritually dead, so the same is true of those first individuals who came to know the living God, according to Model C. They have been called the Homo Divinus, an idea found in the writings of C.S. Lewis, with that Homo Divinus terminology coming from the late John Stott, rector of All Souls Langham Place in London. The Homo Divinus are suggested as the first true humans who were first spiritually alive to God, in fellowship with God, knowing Him in a personal way, providing the earlier spiritual roots of what later came to be known as the Jewish faith. The fall then in Model C is seen as due to the direct disobedience to God's commands of these putative homo divinus, Genesis 3 providing a dramatic figurative description of the alienation, the spiritual death that humankind suffers as a result of sin, with a fiery barrier separating them from the tree of life. And so the model interprets Roman 5 as referring to spiritual death. The Homo Divinus model in particular points to sin as a broken relationship with God, for you cannot break a relationship unless you have one in the first place. The Homo Divinus model also draws attention to the representative nature of the Adam, the archetypal man, as portrayed in the Genesis text. And so the man is therefore viewed as the federal representative, as it were, of the whole of humanity alive at that time. Some might prefer the term corporate solidarity to get across a similar kind of idea. Now, here's the late Derek Kidner, once warden of Tyndale House in Cambridge, which is a, uh, a theological center, and he's writing in his Tyndale commentary on Genesis. And I quote here from Kidner, with one possible exception, the unity of mankind in Adam and our common status as sinners through his offense are expressed in scripture, not in terms of heredity, but simply in terms of solidarity. Adam's sin is shown to have implicated all men because he was the federal head of humanity, somewhat as in Christ's death, one died for all, therefore all died. Adam's federal headship continues Kidna of humanity extended, if that was the case, outwards to his contemporaries, as well as onwards to his offspring, and his, and his disobedience disinherited both alike." Close quote. Now, for a modern version of federal headship, by analogy, we might think of Ataturk, that great political leader who founded the modern Turkish Republic in the early 1920s. His designate name, Ataturk, not his original name, means father of the Turks. Now, that of course does not mean that he is the genetic ancestor of all the Turkish people who are literally descended from him today. It means that Ataturk is viewed as the federal head of all Turks, the one in whom the generations of Turks after him find their present political and cultural state of being. Maybe a further analogy might just help us at this point with Model C, this time relevant to the way that Model C interprets the doctrine of the fool. Let us imagine that a president or a prime minister of a country makes some grievous error of judgment that drags his country into an unwanted international conflict. Sure, we can't imagine such a thing happening. This is a parable. But suddenly, at a stroke, the whole population find themselves in a state that they had not been in the day before, in a state of war. Whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, people had entered a new state of being due to the wrong actions of their representative. And so transferring the analogy to Model C, the very idea of alienation from God now comes into the world. So whereas an Augustinian model, if we can call it that, on the left-hand side of the screen there suggests the actual inheritance of sin from an original couple who are the physical progenitors of the whole of humanity, Model C is suggesting the whole of humanity becomes a prisoner of sin, but through the corporate solidarity with the sin of Adam. Now, amongst my good Bible-believing Christian friends who hold to human evolution, there are some who hold to Model A, and some who hold to Model B1 or B2, and others to Model C, 
and of course others to quite different models altogether. And that's absolutely fine. Because I think the aim of this exercise is simply to see that there are plenty of possible scenarios in which there really is no need to bring science into conflict with faith. Personally, I tend towards Model C, as I find it's more consistent with my own traditional Reformed theology. But equally, I have to accept that the model might be wrong, and hopefully better models will keep coming along. For sure, none of the models will answer all the questions we might have. And by the way, they're all considered in much greater detail in my book, Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose? And so let me give you a plug there if you're interested in how we interpret Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 and, and these other great passages, then there's a lot of detail in that book about those passages. But I think what's really important to see is that there is no need for science to challenge the great biblical narrative of creation, fall, and redemption. For centuries, the idea of human solidarity and the federal headship of Adam have helped to remind us that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, and that the only way of being rescued from both sin and mortality is through the sacrificial work of Christ's substitutionary atoning death upon the cross. And let's never forget also that whatever models we hold or none at all, our true humanity is rooted in being made in the image of God. Here's C.S. Lewis speaking in Prince Caspian, you come from the Lord Adam and the Lady Eve, said Aslan, and that is both honor enough to erect the head of the poorest beggar. Thank you very much for your attention.